the AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much. Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this another webinar series, AI for Earth and Sustainability Science. My name is Joachim Denzel, and I'm happy to moderate today's session. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome and introduce Professor Ribana Rocha. Ribana uh, studied uh, in in uh, University of Bonn in geodesy. She she received a diploma in geodesy in 2008. After that, she did a PhD with the famous uh, supervisor Wolfgang Firstner. Uh, received the PhD in, in 2012, and from this on started a really impressive career in science, uh, including visiting research. Uh, positions at, for example, University of California, Los Angeles, or the Technical University of Munich. And uh, she has been junior professor at the University of Bonn from 2015 to 22. And since then, she is professor at the Research Center Jülich in Germany. And uh, she is working on explainable AI in uh, the area of remote sensing and agriculture. And I'm really personally happy to welcome her because we had already a lot of joint collaborations and even joint papers during the past. And uh, Ribana, I'm really looking forward to your definitely exciting presentation. And please, Ribana, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Joachim, for the introduction. And also, thank you for the invitation. And I will immediately share my screen. And um, yeah. So now you should uh, see it. Um, and what I want to tell you today in this talk is uh, explainable machine learning and how we can use it for the agriculture and environmental sciences. And I want to um, start with a few typical questions we are concerned with. So for example, we ask what is on the field or what is the yield in this area? Or what will this plant look like tomorrow? And in, Digital agriculture, we want to solve such tasks with sensor technologies, with robots, with machine learning and novel management strategies and so on. And for example, in Bonn, um, so here is uh, one example of such a robot. So this robot drives through uh, the, the rows in a class house. So we are not only in, in the field, of course, our ultimate goal is also to apply all the methods in the field. And this robot takes pictures continuously. And um, what can we do now with these pictures? So uh, when we have this, for example, we can um, use um, machine learning and 
uh, some some algorithms to, for example, get uh, such a 3D reconstruction and uh, also the spectral information. And you can already see, you can identify these bell peppers. And when we go one step further, we can use this 3D information and the spectral information to uh, do an instant segmentation to so identify the bell peppers and to get the size and count them and so on. So this is something we are working on at the research center and in Bonn in our excellence cluster Phenorop. But I want to go today with you one step further. So I want to address a different question. For example, why does a plant look like this? Or why does my algorithm perform poorly here? Or how did my algorithm come to a specific result? And these are the questions that are addressed uh, with explainable machine learning. And explainable machine learning in general is about to make deep neural networks more understandable and to answer the questions of how and why. And there are three core elements that need to be considered. So one element is transparency. Transparency is concerned with different ingredients like the architecture or the learning algorithm. But quite often, we have access to these ingredients. So the problem is mostly not the transparency. It's more that the model is too complex to be understandable. And this is where interpretability comes into play. Interpretability is when you present properties of a machine learning model in understandable terms to human. In the simplex exa uh, simplex example, you can think about uh, feature importance that you visualize in, the, uh, in uh, the input space. And then there's explainability. So explainability is when these interpretable entities are combined with domain knowledge and if possible with an analysis goal. And for a large portion of the literature, there's no distinction between interpretability and explainability. But uh, the reason why I think it's important uh, is that an explanation depends on the use case. That means it depends on the domain knowledge. So you can have one interpretation, but different explanations. So it's important to distinguish um, when the explanation starts and which domain knowledge was added. And another important thing I want to mention before I go, I will show you some applications is if you think about it more deeply, it appears that there's a connection to correlation or there's a connection to um, yeah, causation and correlation. Causation means that an output is the result of the occurrence of a specific input. So you have a cause, which is the input, and the effect is the output. Correlation, on the other side, measures the relationship between the input and the output. And if you look uh, at this example um, here, so it rains, that means the plants will grow. It will also mean that I will use an umbrella, but it does not mean uh, that if the plants grow that I will use an umbrella. So you have here clear a correlation, but uh, these two parts here uh, are uh, causation. And when you connect this now to the area of explainable machine learning, we will realize that interpretation tools generally build on correlation because interpretation tools present properties of a machine learning model. And this uh, very often only captures the correlation of, uh, between the input and the output, which is not bad. That's not a bad thing, but we need to take this into consideration. So one thing we really need to take care of is the confirmation bias, which is the underlying tendency of us to search for explanations which are in line with our existing knowledge. So we might tend to explain something which we think we have discovered, but it's actually not in the data or not in the model. But still, so explainable machine learning uh, comprises great tools which help us in many ways, uh, but we also need to keep in mind that what we are able to get out of our data. And I want to show you now a few applications and I, um, um, I uh, structured my talk into three uh, parts based on the reasons to seek explanation. So one reason, for example, or two reasons are justified decision and improved models. Another reason is to enhance control. And another reason is to discover knowledge and to get new insights. And um, I will immediately start with the first one. So in one project in my group, uh, we focus on cauliflower cultivation using image-based UAV. So you, you can see the UAV here and uh, machine learning. 
So our overall goal is to analyze the development and the harvest readiness of cauliflower to support the farmer's decision making. So cauliflower is a high value crop that needs to fulfill high quality criteria. So it needs to be perfectly white and it also needs to have the, uh, the perfect shape. And uh, the difficulty is that each plant uh, developed uh, differently, uh, independently, or even when it was planted at the same time. Um, um, so this is challenging. And typically what farmers do is they um, go to the field with agricultural advisors and they uh, do this on a regular basis and they do this through spot checks and they extrapolate to the whole field. And we wanted to optimize this process. And what we did is we monitored the entire growing period uh, using UAV images, which you can see here in the video. And um, so, uh, and what we did then, we georeferenced the data. You can see this on these uh, ground control points here in the field. And so we can track single plants over time and estimate, for example, their size. And so what we further did is we used a neural network to detect uh, single cauliflower plants in an early growth stage, uh, indicating with the bonding box. So we know exactly where plants are. And then because the data is georeferenced, we can extract the time series over time. This is actually a data set that is publicly available. It's called, uh, it's called Crowleyflower. You can download it and play around with it. Uh, we are happy when you do this. Um, and then we trained another network, a classification network, and we decided for the last stages if these uh, images are ready for harvest or not. And you can already see uh, the difficulty. So it's not the cauliflower you might know from the supermarket. So it's actually the head needs to be covered uh, so it stays white. So you can only see leaves. And we reached an average class accuracy of 73% and an overall accuracy of 72%. That was already quite good because um, yeah, the farmer and yeah, some, some expert told us it's not actually possible to uh, determine the head size uh, without grabbing it and just by taking images. But uh, we now wanted to get more of, uh, out of our results and we tested uh, several interpretation tools which will result in a so-called saliency map. So a saliency map uh, is um, something what you can see here, and a pixel in a saliency map indicates how much it contributes to the result. And I will briefly uh, present two interpretation tools, occlusion sensitivity maps and graph cam, what we use for our data set. So occlusion sensitivity maps, uh, what happens here is you have a trained network that is fixed and you systematically cover up parts of the input image and you have a look at uh, how much the result will change. And this change is actually, actually the sensitivity. And when you plot this, um, when you do this for all parts in the image and you plot this, you get an occlusion sensitivity map, which is illustrated here. And Another procedure, different procedure, is based on, uh, on gradient. It was um, specifically uh, developed for convolutional neural networks. It's called gradient weighted class activation map, so GRADCAM, very commonly used. Um, what happens here is you go to the mostly last convolutional layer and you take the activation maps from there. And these activation 